When you're developing a mobile or a web application or even just a website, one of the biggest um, concerns that you'll have from both a cost and performance standpoint is going to be what type of storage you're using. Now you could use storage for a multitude of reasons. Um, maybe if you're developing an application, you'll have users that are uploading photos or videos. You'll need a place to actually store those. Um, if you're developing a website, you might want a content delivery network or even just site backups. And um, attaching external storage is not all that hard, but understanding the different options that you have is a little bit confusing, especially if you're not an IT professional. I wanted to put this tutorial together for exactly that reason, because if you go on Google and type in the different types of storage, so let's see, file versus block versus object, those are generally the three that you'll find. Um, you'll get a lot of explanations that are kind of just so-so. Most of them are just pitching you know, that company's storage solutions, so they don't really go above and beyond to explain the differences um, between them, especially for non-IT folks. So if you're a developer like myself, that I, I really don't care to understand the true nuances of data storage. I just want to know what my options are and what are some of the advantages and disadvantages. So that's what this, is video, this video is going to be for. And you don't really have to know anything about storage to understand it. Before we get into the different types of storage, we truly need to understand why the storage thing is important in the first place. And that is because um, when you're working with a virtual machine, um, it actually has something called ephemeral or non-persistent storage. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, to, to truly understand that, um, you have to take a step back and, and think about what these big companies like Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, or Microsoft Azure, what they're actually offering you from a cloud computing standpoint. If you walked into Amazon Web Services, one of their facilities, they've got tons across, I think they probably have seven or eight main facilities across the globe. Um, they just are basically a bunch of servers running in a single room. And you can think of each individual server kind of like an apartment complex. So an apartment complex has several units within it. And when someone moves into a new unit, they can put it, put whatever they want in there, you know, add a bed, a couch, TV, whatever you may want to add to your, to your unit. Now with these servers, it's kind of the same thing. Um, each server is going to have plenty of space, so these companies will actually rent out subunits of these servers called virtual machines. And when you rent a virtual machine, you pick the size of the storage that you want, and once you log into it, you can store whatever files you'd like. You can run servers, you know, host a website, all those kind of things. But when you move out of that um, server or that virtual machine, just like an apartment, you got to take all your stuff with you and it's not going to be persistent. So once you leave, it's all gone. To explain this a little bit better, um, I'm going to actually show you in real life what this looks like. I know this might be a little bit too much for some people, but I wanted to, to show you more tangibly what I'm talking about here since I feel like it's often left out when explaining these concepts. So we'll go over to DigitalOcean, which is the um, service that I use. It's basically the same thing as like Amazon Web Services, but it's geared more towards like individual developers, small teams. Um, it's really easy to use and it's priced pretty competitively. So I, I really like that. I'll leave a link in the description for you if you want to check it out. So we'll create what they call a droplet. It's basically a virtual machine which remember each server is like an apartment complex, multiple units, i.e. multiple virtual machines. So right now, when we click get started with a droplet, what we're doing is we are picking what kind of virtual machine we want. I'll just pick the cheapest. I'm gonna delete this right after this tutorial. 
So we'll pick the $5 a month one. So all we're asking for is um, 25 gigabytes of hard disk space, which is just a tiny portion of each of DigitalOcean's servers. So we're basically renting a studio apartment here. So we'll go down. I don't need to add any of this yet. Um, we'll run it out of, I don't know, New York. And I'm going to use this SSH key. Don't worry about all these specifics. I'm not really trying to explain how to, to work a virtual machine. Um, just kind of demonstrating the storage stuff. Once your virtual machine has initiated, basically what has happened is I now am paying for, I just signed a lease with this um, you know, server for a individual unit of, or little apartment unit of this server. So um, it's in indicated by this IP address. So we'll copy that and then we'll go into the terminal to log in. We'll just type sshp22 for port 22 and then give it the IP address that we're using. So this is basically just gonna log us in. You'll see that we are logged in now and this terminal is now operating a virtual machine which sits on a server out in New York. So if we um, create a file, this is just how we create a file for those that are not familiar. Um, type the touch command and we'll say new file.txt. We'll open that file up and add some text. Okay. In real life, you'd probably add an entire website, a bunch of code here. Um, but I just wanted to add that one file, the new file.txt, to demonstrate what's happening here. So we'll stay logged in and go back to our DigitalOcean. And now I want to attach some block storage. Now I know I haven't explained what block storage is yet, but just bear with me, we'll get to it eventually. So I'll add a volume. This is the equivalent of block storage. Um, I only need, we'll say five gigabytes. I'm gonna, again, delete this in a second. And what I'm going to do is attach it to this virtual machine that we just made. And I'll call it my block storage and we want to automatically format and mount and we'll use the ext4 file system which is essentially what most Linux distributions will use for their file systems. So it tells me here that the um, the volume has been attached so we can go back to our terminal which I haven't touched anything and we'll see that if we go to the mount directory right here we have my block storage and we can go into my block storage and create another file and we'll put some stuff in that file and now we have stored some data on this volume or block storage so why did I go through this exercise? The reason is to demonstrate what ephemeral storage is. So we have two files that we created. One of them is just sitting on the virtual machine and another one is sitting in that new volume that I just created. So we have them in two different places. Now if I just stored stuff on the virtual machine and then I came back to um, DigitalOcean and let's go to our droplets and then we just deleted the droplet entirely so we're going to destroy the virtual machine that we just created that droplet has been destroyed and we have no possible way to get back that file that we made that was called new file so that is gone forever but we still have access to the file that we created in our mounted um, block storage or volume as DigitalOcean calls it. So let's create one more droplet here. Again, we're going to choose the cheap one and we're going to this time add some block storage. 
So we'll say add volume and we'll say attach existing. And you see right here we have this separate block storage that we had originally created. And since we created it in New York, it's only going to let us use the New York one. So we will add our SSH keys and say new virtual machine. We have our new virtual machine which should have that um, block storage attached to it. So we'll again get the IP address for it, go back to our terminal and log in. Then we will go to our mount directory and you'll see that we've got nothing there. That's because we have to format our um, or configure our block storage. So if we go back to our volumes and then we see this block storage, it's already attached to this new virtual machine that we made but we need to configure it. So we'll go to the config instructions. It tells you exactly how to do it. So I'll just copy that, come back to the terminal and type in all those commands. And now you'll see that we have the block storage. If we go into that block storage, you'll see we have this file that we created on the last virtual machine. So in all, the point I'm trying to make is the fact that if you leave all of your files, so maybe you have your users uploading files to your virtual machine file system, it's going to be fine as long as you don't terminate that virtual machine and your data center does not crash ever. So you're pretty safe, but you're definitely not safe enough for comfort because it'd be a complete nightmare if you lost all of your users data. So that is the reason why we need to attach additional storage to our virtual machine and kind of separate out those concerns. Hopefully by now you understand why you need all this storage um, attached to you know, maybe your virtual machine. But what are your options? Now there are four types of storage that I'm gonna be covering. And the first two, um, which would be DAS and NAS, you'll learn what that means in a second, those are not necessarily applicable to um, web development in terms of like a web app, a website, or maybe even a mobile app. It's mainly the stuff that I cover on this channel, so not necessarily relevant, but still good to understand. The second two, block and object storage, are going to be much more relevant, and we'll dig a little bit deeper into them. So the first one that we will cover is called Direct Attached Storage, or DAS. Now most people know what this is already because you've used it. So you've got a laptop in front of you, probably watching this video on a laptop, maybe a phone, and there's a little hard drive that sits within that laptop. Now this would be called Direct Attached Storage because it is directly attached. Now, this is great because it's cheap, it's easy to use. I think I bought my six terabyte external hard drive for just like 100 or 200 bucks, something like that. So it's extremely cheap for what you're getting. The cons would be it's not shareable. So if you wanted to share your data with someone else, you'd have to either upload it from your device to the cloud or walk it over to that person's computer to share it. So that's definitely not very useful in some scenarios. And then also, it's not really used, as I said, it's not really used in cloud um, computing environments because you know these services like Amazon Web Services, Azure, um, Google Cloud, the people working there, they're not gonna be walking around with little external hard drives, plugging them into all the different virtual machines or the, or the servers that they're running in their um, warehouses. So. This is not really a cloud computing thing, but it's important to understand. The next one is going to be NAS, which means Network Attached Storage. Now, understanding NAS um, by many descriptions seems very complex, but it's really not that hard. Um, this picture on the screen right here, that is a NAS device, 
And there's really only two things, um, maybe three things that you have to understand. Number one, um, that box has internet connectivity. So we'll talk about it in a second, but that box is connected to some local area network. Number two, you've got these hard drives sitting inside this box. So on this one, there's five of them. And number three, these hard drives can be configured into what we call a RAID configuration. That means a redundant array of independent disks. And in other words, basically what I'm saying is you can set up these, you know, I think there's five of them here. You can set up those five hard drives to replicate data in various ways. So maybe you do a RAID 1 configuration, say there's only four of them, uh, four hard drives, and two of them are replicated amongst each other, and the other two are replicated amongst each other. That would be a RAID 1 configuration. Not going to get into all the different configurations. Just know that you can set those hard drives up to, you know, store data all independently, a little bit replicated, or fully replicated. So you have some sort of assurance that if one of them fails, um, you're not going to lose all of your data. Although this is going to be more expensive than um, directly attached storage, it's still pretty cheap. I think that box right there, I, I haven't looked it up or anything, but I would assume it's around a thousand bucks. Um, and then you have to actually purchase the hard drives to go into it, so a couple hundred bucks there. So it's it's not exactly cheap, but it's not super expensive if you want to have this at home. It's also really great for collaboration if you've got a bunch of files that a bunch of people are working on. So a perfect example would be an office building where maybe you have 10 employees that all need to work on the same drive. That's going to be perfect for this because when you um, see this on your computer, it'll show up as a single drive. It's also nice because you have centralized control of all the files so you can set permissions on who can see what in the network. And finally, as we talked about with the RAID configuration, you can replicate data and make sure that you have backups of that data. Now, the one thing that's a little bit of a downside is that the network attached storage is going to be connected to a local area network, which basically means that if you have some activity um, or if there's a ton of activity on your network, it's going to slow this down a little bit. So if you ever have heard of a shared drive, so Google Drive, Dropbox, um, iCloud, all these are shared drives. These are going to be, this is basically the equivalent of a shared drive. So you can see the NAS device attaches to a router, which then attaches, well, the router is the network, kind of facilitates the network. So all of the client computers can connect to that Wi-Fi network and get files to and from the NAS device. The next type of storage is going to be called block storage, but we're not quite ready to get into that yet. As we saw on the, um, the NAS storage, this is also considered file-based storage, um, and you'll see a lot of comparisons online that try to distinguish the differences between file storage and block storage. And I think it gets really confusing because everyone's kind of talking from different contexts. So if you look at something like a hard drive, so this hard drive right here, that is actually a block storage device, which basically means that it is broken up into partitions, which then store files on a file system as little 512 byte blocks. So here in this little diagram, I've shown an example hard drive Chances are you're not going to probably have this many partitions, but you can see that we can run the ext4 file system on partition 1 and 3, which is basically the Linux file system. We can run the Apple file system on partition 2, and the Windows NTFS file system on partition 4. So if you plugged your computer in, um, or if you plug this into your computer, and maybe you're running a Windows computer, you could access this partition 4, which has, it's going to have all the Windows files. Um, maybe you have, I don't know, an Excel document that you've opened up and we'll say it is 200 kilobytes. So 200 kilobytes, that's about 200,000 bytes. 
at and if we say that each block in here these little gray blocks are about 500 and well not about they are 512 bytes um, I think I calculated this out it's about 62 62 and a half blocks that you're going to need for that particular Excel file now one of the great things about this um, block storage device is when you um, edit your Excel file maybe you make changes to cells a1 through a4 I don't know um, that's only going to affect just a few blocks within that entire file so say the file is 62 and a half blocks maybe you only have to edit four of them um, and when you press save it's going to only find the four that it needs to edit it'll edit them and then the file is saved you don't have to do it all at once so it's really efficient in that way. Now the confusing part is when we're comparing the file versus block storage because in the end what we see as users is always going to be this hierarchical file system here on the left. You know it, it's very simple. Got the parent folder, some files, child folder, another file, pretty simple. And this file system is read from each of these partitions but the partitions are going to be um, storing the files as blocks. Now, this concept is in the context of um, just general computing. Now, when we bring it into the context of cloud computing and we're talking about block storage, it actually means a little bit of a different thing. So, block storage in the cloud computing um, kind of area is going to be equivalent to the SAN or storage area network. The reason that it is kind of associated with SAN is because the SAN is basically a network of hard drives which are block based storage. So it's taking those direct attached storage devices that we saw way back here and it's putting them in a network. So it's kind of similar to the NAS but you've got one major difference here. The big difference here between the NAS and the SAN is that the SAN or storage area network, also called block-based storage, is going to be much more efficient. And that is because it's connected over fiber optic cables rather than um, a local area Wi-Fi network. So if you know how fast fiber optic cables are, um, you can run somewhere around like up to 128 gigabits per second and your common download speed on a Wi-Fi network is going to be something like 96 megabits per second which basically means that the um, fiber optic cables are about a thousand times faster than your you know not even average above average Wi-Fi network so you can see how this is going to be much um, higher performance um, it's also really scalable just to add more hard drives and as we talked about, since it's on fiber optic cables, it's great for a lot of read-write operations. Maybe you have um, a database that is constantly updating. That's going to be a great use case for this. There's a few downsides to the storage area network. Number one, it's very expensive. Um, it's not gonna be ridiculously expensive if you're using it for cloud computing. Um, but if you try to set it up on your own, it's going to be expensive, it's going to be complex, um, it's just tough to set up. So um, that would be the downsides, but overall this is probably one of the more common um, types of storage that you'll see in cloud computing. You actually saw this a little bit earlier when I was demonstrating ephemeral storage. Um, when we went over to DigitalOcean and we created a volume, so you can see that we can enter any sort of storage number and we can easily scale this up or down so if we needed more storage it's as easy as coming in here and typing oh I need 500 gigabytes okay fifty dollars a month so not the cheapest but it's very convenient very nice um, for a lot of different use cases the last type of storage called object storage is a little bit different from everything that we've talked about before it's kind of in a whole different realm it's a slightly newer type of file storage and um, it, it works a lot differently. So the biggest difference here is, well, actually there's several big differences. Um, number one, you have 
objects rather than files or blocks. So basically you just have a bunch of unstructured data objects that have three parts. You have an ID, so an ID. You have metadata, so that might be the authors of the file, uh, the date that the file was created, permissions on the file, so on and so forth. And then you have this blob, which is the unstructured data. Uh, maybe that would be a picture file or uh, a large video file, and that's going to be stored in the blob. So every time you go to update one of these uh, objects, you have to update the entire thing. So rather than as we talked about earlier where if you've got this Excel file and you only update maybe blocks one through four out of 62, um, it's only gonna edit those four blocks. Now with object storage, if you wanted to make any sort of change, maybe you just wanted to, oh, I don't know, change, um, you know, cut out the first five seconds of your video. That's going to basically create an entirely new object. You can't do these piecemeal operations. And therefore, this type of storage is going to be best um, for a very specific use case. And that is storing lots of unstructured static data. In other words, we write once and read many times. Great example of this would be YouTube videos. Once the author has uploaded it, they're not going to really change it that much. So um, that's going to be a perfect use case for object storage. Another distinguishing um, difference between object storage and block storage and all the other stuff is the way that the, the data is accessed. So with block storage, we had talked about how it's on a local area network, it's transferred over Wi-Fi, um, but it's actually going from machine to machine. Now with um, block storage, you're getting it over fiber optic cables directly connected. Um, now with object storage, we're actually going to be making HTTP request. So this is good and bad. The good, it's easy for developers um, to work with object um, storage because you can just integrate it right into your code, make an HTTP request, and you've uploaded your video or whatever file that you're uploading. The bad thing is that means that you're always going to have to be online and it's affected by the network that you're on because an HTTP request is going to be basically on the internet. So as we said, this is going to be great for lots of static um, storage. So if you had like a content delivery network, user data that was like photos or videos, um, maybe even backups of your website, this is going to be great for those use cases. The one downside is it's pretty expensive. Um, it's, it's not the cheapest storage to buy. Um, I know I said block storage was also pretty expensive, but on the, the scale, this is probably going to be the top tier just because it's very efficient and it's also pretty new in terms of storage. Last thing I wanted to get through before wrapping up this video is the storage product names that all these different services are giving the products. So I know marketing departments do their best to you know, market their product as the best thing ever, but in the end, all of these products are going to be the same regardless of what they are called. So you can pause the video, just look through this chart. For example, um, S3 is the simple storage service that Amazon offers, but really it's just object storage, nothing more than that. So pause the video, look through this if you want. Um, otherwise, that is the end of the video. If you liked it, do me a big favor and hit the subscribe button and give this video a like. Until next time, I will see you later.